welcome to Hillside Community Church and our Sunday morning online broadcast. Uh, for those of you who are joining us over the airwaves here, glad to have you with us. And uh, for those who are attending our church regularly, it's too bad that we can't meet together in person, but uh, with the COVID restrictions till at least November the 7th, we're going to be meeting online and uh, we won't be having regular scheduled church uh, meetings. But uh, we definitely can meet together online and hear the Word of God today. Um, for those of you who are following from outside, uh, thank you for joining us this morning. And my prayer is that you would, uh, you would glean some goodness from our uh, message this morning. So today we're going to be continuing on in our sermon series in the book of First Peter. Uh, this is where we left off. Last week we left off at uh, the end of chapter 2. We're launching into chapter 3 in a two-part mini-series that I'm calling Family Matters. So today I'm going to be talking about the family relationship, specifically the relationship between a husband and wife. So let's bow in a word of prayer before I begin. Heavenly Father, I'm thankful for each person that's listening today, and I just pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would speak into um, their lives. God, I know that you love each and every person that's out there today, and I, I, I pray, God, that uh, what you want to say would come forth from my lips today. And I thank you for each person in Jesus' name. Amen. Family life. Family life is important to God. A proper relationship between a man and a woman and the family that is born from them is a beautiful thing. And of all the human relationships, marriage has been chosen to be the core of the human family. Now, when it functions the way that God intended it and designed it to be functioning, it's the closest and most intimate of all earthly relationships. Now, marriage was designed that way. It's true that with every kind of love, a person gives themselves one way uh, to another person. And in the union of a fully functional marriage, not only the heart, but the body and the entire personality is, um, is given uh, to the other person. Now, when a man and woman love each other in this way, the man uh, wants to belong to the woman and, and the woman wants to belong to the man as it's written in Ephesians chapter 531. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. When functioning as it uh, intended by God, this relationship is deep and it, it's really meaningful. And it is a wonderful thing. It's true that relationships can bring you the greatest joy, but they can also bring you the greatest pain. Now, when sin enters the equation of human relationships, and marriages in particular, and people do not uh, approach marriage in the giving way that God originally intended, uh, what is de designed to be uh, a cemented, secure foundation and centerpiece for the family it is shattered. When one or both parties begin to act um, selfishly, husbands mistreating their wives and wives mistreating their husbands, what was designed to be the most wonderful and resilient of human relationships can develop into the most painful, dysfunctional, and hurtful of all experiences. Broken marriage may bring intense suffering. We, we know this. Many people have been subject to the pain of such experiences. And before I start to dialogue with you about God's design for marriage, I, I just want to pause for a moment and, and speak to you. If you're broken, and, and if you've experienced um, a painful, abusive, or dysfunctional relationship that has ended badly, or maybe it's still going on and, and you're enduring it, I, I want you to know that there's healing through Jesus. There is forgiveness and mercy for all who call upon the name of the Lord. And, and even though scars may remain, there is hope for the future. And, and God's grace, His healing, forgiveness, and restoration are, are very real. And, and Jesus offers 
this healing and restoration freely. So if you're presently involved in a pain-filled relationship or you've ended a pain-filled relationship and you don't know how that you can go on, I want you to know that there's hope for you and, and, and there's, there's promises in God's Word that are for you. In, in, this, falling, in this fallen world, because of sin, there, there's much suffering. There is no way to avoid it. But as a Christian, when we suffer for doing what is right, our, our suffering serves a purpose. For instance, a Christian who is living rightly before God, even in the midst of suffering, can affect the people around them in a way that they see their need for a relationship with the living God. Now there's instructions here in 1 Peter for every married Christian, whether your marriage is good and intimate or distant and strained, whether your spouse is an unbeliever or a committed believer. Now as a Christian, you must be radically different and have a radically different view of marriage than that of the world around you. Now your marriage is not primarily a vehicle for personal affirmation, self-fulfillment, or even happiness. Peter suggests that one of the things that marriage can be is marriage can actually become a platform for introducing uh, a spouse to Jesus. Uh, don't, don't misunderstand me. There's nothing wrong with affirmation, fulfillment, and happiness as far as they go, but that's now not how the, the, the Christian fundamentally sees his or her marriage. Instead, you see your marriage, good or difficult, is one of the most important places where you live out your faith in Jesus Christ. It's in marriage that your faith becomes refined and, and results in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus is revealed. Let me put it this way. Peter says in chapter 2, verse 11, that Christians, as Christians, were strangers and exiles in this broken and godless world. And I talked some about that last week, but we are called by the Lord to look at our lives in terms of God's glory and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and eternal life in Jesus that is to come. This heavenly paradigm includes how we look at marriage and relation, the family relationship in the present. Please let me explain. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter wrote specifically about how Christians displaying the proper attitudes towards civil authorities of various kinds can shine the light of Jesus into the darkness and influence people positively, pointing them to the hope that we have in Christ. In 1 Peter 3, Peter then next moves on to speak with people in the same context on, on a domestic level. So in chapter 2, he speaks in this civil level. And in chapter 3, he speaks in a domestic level. Peter starts off addressing uh, married women. This is where he's going to start now. I'm going to be talking to married women uh, today primarily. But uh, husbands, uh, you are part two, so you, <laughs> you get to hear what God has to say in part two. But uh, this is for everybody. Um, but primarily, Peter here addresses the married ladies. Likewise, he says in First Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. So the, the Apostle Peter speaks with full knowledge of the implications of a, a Christ, Christian person in marriage, suggesting to them that if they carry themselves that is in in line with what is pleasing to God domestically, they will deeply influence their own family relationships so that the uh, other person in the relationship will see their need for a relationship with Jesus Christ. So in this context, Peter says, wives, submit yourselves or subject yourselves to your husband, husband's authority. If we're all honest, for those of us who are married, we have a lot of learning to do when it comes 
to how we're supposed to respond to one another as men and women, as husbands and wives. For those who are not yet married, you may do well to pay attention, close attention, to the principles of this passage as well. After reading uh, chapter 3, verse 1, um, I think we need to uh, clarify in verse 1 what being subject to or submissive uh, in the context of a lady being submissive to her husband, what it, what it actually means. Firstly, I, I must say that wives being subject to your own husbands uh, does not say that women need to be subject to all men, but when a woman enters into a marriage covenant, there is a type of leadership um, hierarchy in that relationship which comes into effect with uh, her own husband. And, and this is God's idea. In addition to this, being subject to your husband does not mean you have to agree with everything he says as if you can't speak or think for yourself. Um, you do not check off your brain at the altar in the wedding ceremony. Um, verse 1 is clear that Peter is speaking to some women whose husbands are, are not believers. These ladies definitely have a, a different opinion about God. Their worldview is different than that of their husbands, and that, that's the most important thing in the world, but they have a different worldview. Um, so Peter cannot be suggesting in this case that women who are subject to their husbands authority must agree with everything that their husbands believe to be true. Otherwise, um, it wouldn't have been worded that way. As well as evidenced by the same verse, being subject to a husband does not mean putting, uh, not putting uh, effort into changing the mind on, of the husband on things. It, it's clear that through her demeanor that she is to attempt to change his mind on, on things. So, um, it also doesn't mean that uh, a wife should put the will of her husband ahead of the will of Christ. And it does not mean that the wife gets her primary spiritual strength through her husband. So, if you, you look at this passage, you see these principles in it. So, bear with me as we struggle through this passage of Scripture together. Some of this has, has been taken wrongly. But I tell you, this is worth the struggle because our spouses and our prayers depend, and our families, the health of our children, depend on proper th uh, thinking concerning marriage. This context, in this passage, in context, deals uh, with a world. Now we, we look back at, at Peter, a world that was just starting to emerge as a Christian society. So, the message of freedom through Jesus Christ was spreading through that society uh, like wildfire. The church was growing in leaps and bounds all the way through Asia Minor. Peter's addressing these churches in uh, northern, the northern half of Turkey, uh, Asia Minor. Gentiles who had been steeped in pagan practices were becoming Christians. And in the case of Jewish families, people were steeped in Judaism and they, they were also coming to Christ. In the first century, uh, married women who had given their lives to Jesus were likely asking questions as to whether or not they should leave their husband or change their behavior towards him because they had now come to an understanding of the truth of God's salvation. So this is at the inception of the church. Uh, people that were married were coming to Christ. One person would come. And uh, they're asking themselves these questions. In the culture of the world of the first century, it was almost unthinkable for a wife to adopt a different religion than her husband. Most people at that time were not atheists. There were very few atheists. Most of them were very deeply religious people. And there was a desperate need for teaching in this area so that Christian wives might know the attitude in which they should live now that they had been converted to living their lives for Jesus Christ. So Peter addresses this passage specifically uh, to Christian wives. This, this is the first part of family matters. And then he speaks even more specifically to Christian wives whose husbands are not yet believers and who do not 
And those husbands are not obeying the word of God. So from the very beginning, even during Jesus Christ's ministry, uh, there have been women who became Christians, but their husbands didn't. Or maybe their husbands were nominal Christians, uh, would say they're believers, but uh, have little or no interest in spiritual things. And and this has been a common pattern through uh, the church throughout the ages. You more seldom see Christian men whose wives are unbelievers, but there are always women in every church whose husbands aren't believers. Whether our, our world accepts this or not, there is a difference between how me, women and, and men are hardwired. A, at the very core of our beings, um, most women, I, I think if you look at most women, they long to be cherished by the one who loves her. Where at the same time, men in the core of their beings desire to be respected by the woman who loves him. Now, Peter addresses these underlying questions by telling the woman that um, they were to live in a way that would show their husbands the power of God's love alive in them and in, in, in the way they respond to their husbands. Peter said these things under the assumption that there would likely um, be some suffering in the process of this, just as in the case of subjecting yourselves to civil authorities. Um, there is sometimes painful uh, realities of submitting ourselves to a uh, domestic relationship where someone has authority over us. The apostle was careful to say uh, that the women were to be subject to their own husbands. Um, some versions use the word submit. Now, God has uh, set up structures of submission in the home the same manner and, and principle of st- structure uh, that is set up in society uh, with government or employer uh, or authority, um, which we've seen in uh, the second chapter of this book. Now, God created an authority structure for the, the benefit of mankind, that as long as man follows his design order in the spirit that he intended it, they would collectively benefit from following the design. The problem is when people are sinners, they step out of God's intended um, design for certain relationship uh, parameters and everything becomes scrambled eggs and, and we have chaos as a result. Now God, God desired that the woman who comes to know him would exemplify uh, to their husband excellence in character by willingly submitting to them and that by displaying such excellent of, excellence of character they might win their spouses to, over to see God for who he truly is. Now, now we all know this, that there's differences between men and women. Men are definitely from Mars. Women are definitely from Venus. We're from two different planets in uh, our makeup and how we're made up inside. I mean, there's a lot of similarities, but the way that we think, for the most part, is, is quite different at times. And uh, you see, if a wife does not tune in to her husband she will assume that his needs are exactly the same as hers and, and subsequently he will not, she will not really hear his needs. She hears his words, but not the meaning. And I'm convinced that uh, the problem of our society today, today is that many people are not really listening to their spouse's essential needs. Case in point, um, uh, some ladies... Uh, assume they know their man's needs based upon their own needs. Unfortunately, they don't have ears open to the true needs and subsequently miss the needs of their man. And, and, it, and this causes problems. And it's vice versa as well. Men have the same issue. But ladies, I'm specifically addressing this today. Um, I'll be talking with men about their, uh, their cues and what they need to understand about women uh, next week. It's true that uh, men, for the most part, uh, a lot of them, a lot of men anyways, do not communicate uh, needs directly. In in general terms, uh, we don't necessarily like to divulge 
the core of our being at the drop of a hat. And yet, we will reveal ourselves if our wives speak to us in a language that we understand and that we, uh, we generally see as, uh, as, as loving. Now, why did your husband marry you in the first place, ladies? I'm going to ask you. You made him feel more special than any other girl. You treated him like he was somebody. You believed in him. If now, since you married him, you, if, you, if you get into the practice of downgrading him in public or, or never agreeing with him or, or disrespecting his opinions when you go against uh, him um, on different matters, um, you go against the very basis for why he married you. When uh, I need to say this gently, but when you make him appear foolish and use sarcasm against him publicly, um, you're undermining the foundation of your relationship with him. There's a God-given secret here, and, and I need you to get this. It's disclosed in this scriptural passage. Inner beauty and gentleness opens men to disclose themselves to their wives. You want to have your, your man open up to you and, and become intimate with you and relationally, uh, you know, with that friendship, that closeness. Um, the best way that you can do that is by respecting him and and loving him in that manner, inner beauty and gentleness towards him will open your man to to being more, uh, I guess you could say, more close to you relationally. Now, how should a man, a Christian woman living with an unbelieving spouse, see her marriage? Um, you should look at your marriage a, a, as a place for you to commend Christ to your husband through your behavior. You seek to win him without words. Uh, just in case that sounds too theoretical, uh, Peter gets down to the nitty-gritty and tells w- what that looks like in real life. He tells the wives that they are to be subject to their own husbands. Now, don't get me wrong, okay? I, I need you to understand where I'm going with this. Galatians 3.28 paints a very clear picture of how God views people. It shows us that, it's, that there's no hierarchy of importance in the kingdom of God. Okay, We're not talking about hierarchy of importance. We're talking hierarchy of position, of decision-making, of leadership. Because there is no hierarchy of importance in the kingdom of God. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This being said, there's a social order. And the reason why there's a social order is because it's necessary to function uh, properly in society to have that order. The, the reason we submit to authority as Christians is because we live under God and under Christ. And, as, and all human authority, good or bad, was put here by God. Now, this isn't the way that people naturally think. We naturally push back. We naturally resist authority. In our flesh, we resist it. But as a new creation in Jesus Christ, we are to submit to human authority because we are free to do so in Christ. For the several past several decades or so, there's been a movement which has grown in the evangelical church called egalitarianism. Egalitarianism argues that there is no submission, there's no authority in marriage. And, and you can find books and articles written by people with, from Christian colleges, different seminary degrees, and some churches take this view as well. But the arguments that are presented by egalitarianism, uh, I don't believe they measure up and hold up to what the Bible says. 
they have to go through all kinds of interpretive gymnastics, I guess you might say, to explain away this plain teaching in Scripture. In plain language, um, here it is. Submission or be, being subject to. Uh, the Greek word for, for submission in this case is derived out of a military context. And, and just so that you're aware, you know, I, I've got some experience with uh, paramilitary structure because, of course, before I became a pastor, uh, I was a policeman. And in fact, I still am one, uh, one day a week. But this word submission has the sense of, of rank and authority. It, it means to yield the ground of personal interest to another out of respect for the position that they have been granted. And, and usage and upon usage throughout the Bible, this is the only meaning that makes sense. Jesus, God the Son, submits to the Father. Believers are called to submit to Christ. Children are called to submit to parents, citizens to governing authorities, employers or employees to employers, wives to husbands. The submission and hierarchy is clearly painted in human society, and we see it evident in the scriptures. As Peter says, for you wives who are suffering the particular pain of an unbelieving husband, it may be through this very submission that, that you win your husband over to Christ. But remember, I, I, this must be said. Okay? No human authority that is given is absolute. You never submit when commanded to do what God forbids, or if the one in authority forbids another to do what God commands, you, you are free to resist that behavior. Wives in that situation are obliged to obey God rather than their husband. This includes uh, fleeing from physical abuse and, and are calling the police to intervene uh, to preserve uh, your safety or the safety of your children when there's evil behavior. God commands us to preserve life and, and the power of the state is to be used as uh, something to keep societal evil in check. In most cases, what does sub submission to authority mean? It doesn't mean uh, subjection to that without dialogue. It means after you speak your mind, however, you state your case, you respectfully and graciously give the person in authority the deciding vote. In matters big and small, uh, you submit to the authority established by God because your Lord Jesus uh, your Lord is Jesus Christ, I should say, and, and you want to do all that you can to make him known. Submission in marriage follows the same principles as, as the other spheres of living. If we want to be an effective ambassadors for Christ in any sphere of our lives, we must follow God's design. Whenever we submit to God's appointed authority as our obligation before God, we're acting in a way that is pleasing to him. We must understand this. This is the best way to live. Unless, of course, the appointed authority directs us to sin. In that case, it's right that we say no to human authority and obey God rather than, uh, than the authority. Peter continues his dialogue towards ladies, and, and he goes on to say in verses 3 and 4, Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing that you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. You see, the true value of a Christian is not superficial. And this is true in the case of married ladies as well. This particular scripture has often been taken out of context um, Peter is not saying that it's wrong for women to adorn themselves with a nice hairstyle or, or jewelry or clothing. 
And in the past, in Christian circles, this teaching has become legalism and bondage, and the intention was, was missed, where ladies purposely tried to make themselves look plain and unattractive on the outside, thinking that this was the emphasis of this teaching of Scripture, and that somehow plainness is pleasing to God. Have you ever seen a documentary, for instance, on birds of paradise, how colorful, how wonderful God created them to be and, and just the splendor of how they look. Um, look, at, look at an alpine meadow filled with flowers with the panorama of uh, snow-capped mountains in the background, how beautiful it is, or the songbirds and their intricate singing and how wonderful that is. Now, Peter's not saying that uh, ladies should make themselves outwardly plain and physically unattractive, but what he is emphasizing, what he's saying, is that they should not be placing um, their primary emphasis on outward beauty. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, he says in verse 5, by submitting to their own husbands. Verse 6 says, As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. In other words, Peter exhorts the wives in his audience to be confident in God like the godly women of the scriptures. Sarah is exemplified in the case. Now, in a patriarchal culture, some of the women of old culture uh, called their husbands Lord. I should say that is a small L, Lord, uh, while Jesus Christ is large L, Lord. And, and it's like saying, my Lord, and the husband would call his wife, my lady. Now, this is not to say that my wife, Jinya, uh, is to call me Lord, or that you are to call your husband Lord. This is absolutely not culturally uh, acceptable or uh, appropriate. What it is saying is that the women of old had self-control. They showed respect for the authority structure of leadership that God established in the social order. And God desires the same for, for us today. Um, you know, as an example, uh, much the same way as a policeman, uh, I choose to subject myself to the culture of authority in the RCMP organization. It's true, and I'm going to bring this up, that I'm the same age as many officers in the RCMP that are my superiors in, in rank. I've gone through much of the same training as them and have faced the same sort of things that they have in my career. And in some cases, on the practical side, sometimes even more. I recognize that many officers are not better than me as a policeman, nor do they have more experience than me in certain areas. But they, they do hold a superior position of rank. And, and sometimes when I'm dealing with things, uh, I, I may disagree with how a matter is handled. Um, I will respectfully discuss my thoughts with my superior officer in that case, expressing my feelings and opinions or concerns. A and generally speaking, those officers are very open to hearing uh, what I have to say. Out of respect for that position, uh, I will call a ranking officer in the police uh, service, sir or madame. In, in, in the end, I will yield to their words when the ranking officer uh, disagrees with me. Sometimes I change their mind by my suggestions, but sometimes I don't, and sometimes they make a decision which is probably not what I would do. And sometimes they're proven to be wrong based upon the decision they've made. But other times they're right. But needless to say, I have an obligation in the hierarchical structure of the organization to, to yield the final say to them. Now, in another way of looking at thing is, things as a police officer, uh, I, I call a provincial court judge your honor as a respectful gesture. But if it goes even deeper than that, if I have a Supreme Court case, 
um, I will call my I will call the judge my lord or my lady. And uh, it's a gesture of respect. Um, do, do those judges, they, do they make poor decisions at times? Do I sometimes make better decisions than them? Absolutely. Do I still respect the position that they've been given and accept their ruling? Absolutely. Effective society depends on effective structure. It's not always perfect because human beings will make mistakes. Just as in a marriage, human beings will make mistakes. Peter expresses that the ladies in his letter should follow Sarah's example if they persist in, and if they persist in doing what, what is righteous and do not fear, um, they, if they willingly obey uh, God in this manner, that, um, that God will be pleased with them. This is displaying true trust in God. See, Proverbs 31.30 says, Charm is deceptive and, and beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. So in conclusion to my message today, ladies, you hold a tremendous position in the family. And your position deserves the husband's love, unbridled love towards you. And you also deserve to be respected You see, men, sometimes we get this wrong. Sometimes we think that because the scripture says here that ladies should be subject to the men, that we don't have to respect their thoughts, feelings, opinions, and that they basically have to toe the line. Well, that's not what God intended. Just as he says, husbands love your wives, as Christ loved the church and cared for for us, we're supposed to love our wives. It doesn't let wives off the hook for showing love towards their husbands. Well, in the same way, you need to show proper respect to your partner in life. And when you do, that will will help bridge um, going in different directions. You see, the scriptures say the two shall be one flesh, one meaning unified in their approach to living, to life. And an effective marriage is where both husband and wife respect and love one another. Now, if I am a, a wife and my husband's difficult, at the end, you see, he's going to have to answer to God. And um, I'm going to have to answer to God as well in the way that I carry myself. You know, this is a, an important part of living. And we need to understand that God is not trying to create a, an oppressive environment. He's trying to create an environment that is orderly, that flows well. And, you know, just as in the RCMP, you know, that particular civil authority structure is in place to make sure that uh, when things start falling apart at the seams, you know, we can discuss things, but in the end, someone has to make a decision, and that decision, with that decision comes the responsibility and the fallout of that decision. And a wise leader in that case will regard the, uh, the thoughts, feelings, and... Um, opinions of those under his charge because if he takes those opinions and collectively analyzes them it'll help him make a better decision likewise husbands just because it says wives be subject to your your own husbands doesn't mean that you should be putting uh putting your wife down saying you have to listen to me no matter what i decide that's not the intention of this at all The intention of this is to provide a structure of order so that you should listen to your wife. You should allow her to freely speak her mind. And there should be closeness in that. And you should have that relationship where that 
where that freedom to disagree is there. Now, I've been married for 30 years, and I'm still learning how to do this. So you are too. <laughs> and you see, God, God has given us a blueprint, though. If we, if we follow it and we work together as, as a couple, um, God will show us the way to live in a way that pleases Him in a way that exemplifies Jesus to this broken world. So I trust that um, this message has, uh, has spoken to you, and uh, I just would like us to close in prayer now, if we could just bow our heads. Jesus, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the words that are in this passage. God, sometimes I, I think things are taken the wrong way, and, and Lord, I just pray that we would understand what you're saying here. Um, God, that we would leave this place today feeling um, uh, that we understand your word a little bit more clearly. And God, I just pray for the marriages out there, Father, that you give wisdom to both husbands and wives and that they would leave in a way that's pleasing to you. And God, that you would reach uh, out into this dark world through our family relationships and that people would see the example of faith, love, and purity that you call us to, and that we would shine bright like stars in the universe in the darkness of this broken world. We would be a banner of functionality in in a place that is so filled with brokenness, hurt, pain, dysfunction, God, uh, you, the Christian family is a place of refuge. And, and I pray that we would shine our light so that men would see our good works and glorify you in heaven. In Jesus' name, I pray all these things. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday afternoon.